and share my screen. So today we are going to discuss solutions for the practical exercises from last week because we postponed the deadline and the current theoretical exercises that should have been handed in today. So we have quite a bit of stuff to discuss today. So you should at least be able to see my slides now. So uh, practical exercises. Um, the first thing you were supposed to do was to implement a simple alarm clock. So uh, the first part of this was very simple. So it just ju should just consist of loop to ask the user to enter a number using the scanf function. And this number should represent a delay time in seconds. Then you should wait using the sleep system call for a number of seconds here. And finally, your alarm should ring when the given time has passed. And so uh, after that alarm has uh, ring, uh, rung, uh, then you can ask uh, the user for another delay and uh, schedule another alarm. So I think that was uh, the simple part of it. So we have to include standard IO for printf and scanf and standard lib if we uh, use exit like it's supposed to do. Uh, then we have, for example, I, I use the global variable here for our delay as an integer variable here. And then parts of our question, the first one was, uh, one of the parts was use a loop. So we have just an endless loop here, for example, because I didn't specify any termination criteria. And if you implement some, like inputting a negative number or something, that's of course also fine. So here I just have an infinite loop and this prints our prompt enter alarm delay or something, then it scans using the percent %d format qualifier. So it reads a decimal number, so an integer. And uh, for scanf, we have to pass a pointer to the variable because scanf writes the value of that variable to this memory location. So into our variable delay here. Then afterwards we sleep for the past time. And then we can print f alarm or we can uh, print all this special character backslash a which rings whatever sound you have uh, configured on your system so a bell or something like this or beep well i think that was not a big problem so um, what was more interesting of course were the upcoming questions here so part two of that was uh, to extend this program to support multiple alarms and these alarms should run concurrently. So you could set an alarm uh, 10 seconds in the future. And while this is wait, uh, running in the background, you should be able to set another alarm. So uh, this means after entering a delay for an alarm, you should do this using a new child process. So this was obviously an exercise uh, where you were supposed to use fork. Uh, which uh, then this new child process is responsible for waiting for the given time, sounding the alarm, and then cleanly exit. So essentially for each alarm that we set, we have a separate child process. And this child process just does the same as before it waits. It prints that the alarm is now sounding and then uh, it's terminating. So this means because both parent and child processes run in parallel, that the parent process can already prompt the user for a new alarm delay. So we can set an additional alarm while a previous one is still ticking. The parent should print the process ID. And when a child process sounds an alarm, it should also print its own process ID. So we can uh, see which of our child process actually was raising the alarm. So this is a bit of an extension here. So essentially, uh, well, uh, what we, Include here is unistandard.h for our prototype for fork. And we have an additional variable pit for our process ID here. So the, these lines stay identical. So in our endless loop, we prompt and scan our delay. After that, we fork. So we've seen in the lecture that fork returns twice. So fork creates a child process, which is almost identical to the parent process. And the most important difference is the return process ID. So the process ID returned for the parent process is the process ID of the newly generated child. Whereas the process ID returned when you're running in the child process is zero. So we check this condition here. So if our process ID that we just obtained as a result of fork is zero, we know we're in our child process here. 
So here we can now sleep for our delay, we can print our alarm and then we exit. Otherwise, we know we're in our parent process. So our parent process is supposed to print the process ID of the child. So we know when our process ID is not equal to zero and it's a return value of fork, we have the process ID of our child process input. So we just print it here, whereas our child uh, got a zero as process ID return. So it's not its process ID, obviously, because the child has a process ID not equal to zero. So it needs to obtain its own process ID using the get pit system call here. So essentially this has the endless loop. It creates a background process, which then independently sleeps, whereas our foreground parent process then prints and already starts to ask you for another alarm delay. And when you run this, uh, so I just called this 2.2.c and the executable is 2.2. Um, so you can enter an alarm delay of 10 seconds, for example, it prints, okay, new child, then you enter an alarm delay of five seconds, another child, and then of two seconds, yet one more child. So you would expect the alarms if you enter these, well, one after the other in rapid succession to come in, uh, well, the opposite order because the last alarm we entered should ring first. So after two seconds, we get that output here. Uh, then we get the output of the five seconds alarm and afterwards the 10 seconds alarm. Now, one thing you see here is the output is garbled. So we have our prompt here. And on the same line, we have the output alarm from pit 95,000 something. Of course, these are not colored in the real life. I just colored them here to make it a bit easier to read. Why is this the case? So some have wondered about this on uh, Piazza. Uh, so remember, a parent and a child process share almost everything, including IO channels, so file descriptors. So this means that, of course, both print to your screen. And since the operating system does scheduling, because uh, after entering the alarm delay, we called our, our uh, scanner function here, uh, this is actually a blocking IO call. So our operating system does a process switch to whatever other process is running, of course, including our child processes here. So while this was the last thing that was printed here by our parent process, enter alarm delay, then our cursor would stand here and we would wait for an input, which we haven't had so far. We would have a task switch. And since we don't know that we're sharing the screen, well, our cursor was here. So the next print output just arrives at the position of our cursor and so on. So you can still enter an alarm delay, but the entered characters would appear somewhere after this last alarm message here. So this is one disadvantage when you do it like this, uh, when you rely on using the terminal for input and output, and you have several processes really attaching to the same terminal, you can get garbled outputs like this. All right. Um, so uh, a problem that you have is that when you generate childs and these child processes exit, that you have a zombie process. So a process uh, which uh, doesn't do any useful stuff anymore, but it still needs to be retained somewhere in your operating system, for example, because the parent process might want to read the return code eventually after some time. So one question was, you should observe the processes started by you using the tool PS or top. Um, top is not ideal. There's an alternative HTOP uh, because this allows you to sort for the process state. So this is the output of HTOP and you can click on the header here to sort processes, for example, according to process state. So uh, in the beginning, all child processes here are still sleeping. So here I started four alarms with 60 seconds delay. So they were just all sleeping here all our 2.2 processes, so one of the parent process here, and the others are our child processes here. And after some time, you see uh, two of the child processes have rung the alarm, so after what's called exit. So they're in the zombie state, indicating by the Z here, uh, while the others are still sleeping because I started them a bit later. So you can observe this here. Uh, you can do the same using PS. Uh, now PS gives a lot of output, 
Uh, so what you usually do is you grab for something identifiable in your name. So you could grab for 2.2, .2, which is not such a great name here. You could make it more identifiable, like calling it exercise 2.2 .2, and then just grabbing for exercise. So grab would filter only the output lines. So it would print only the output lines that match your pattern here. And you can see the same. So here you get an S state for sleeping, while you get a Z state for zombie. And you see we have uh, five processes here. So we have the parent process with the lowest process ID. And then we have all four child processes. Two of them have already exited. So they're in zombie state. And PS also indicates this by putting brackets around the process name. Whereas the other two are still sleeping in their sleep call. Now uh, the parent process is also sleeping because it's just waiting for input. And uh, well, uh, that that was uh, on uh, Mac OS X, I think, and that's the output on Linux here. So on Linux, actually, uh, these processes are indicated with the same states, but they're called defunct processes and put in square brackets here. So it looks a bit different on Linux, but the output is essentially the same. So uh, when you want to figure out what all these magic characters mean, as usual, read the man page like the htop or ps man page and there's an entry for state and this says a state of s means it marks a process that's sleeping and z means it's a dead process a zombie and this plus means what we've seen before it's in foreground so it can output to a terminal so all of these processes can output to a terminal and that's why you get this garbled output Yeah, why is the parent sleeping? Well, because it's waiting for input. So it's essentially in a blocked state. And this is also indicated as an S as a sleeping uh, before. Well, uh, we enter any additional characters here. All right, so uh, we should catch our zombies uh, using weight pit. Now the problem is uh, when uh, we're using uh, weight or using weight pit with the wrong parameters, these calls would block until a, a child would exit. Uh, well, that's problematic. So what we want is a non-blocking weight pit. And you can do this uh, by, uh, uh, on the one hand, passing the W no hang option. So that's described the man page of weight pit, obviously. And uh, because you don't want to keep a, a lock of which of the processes you generated, you could do this. You can also tell weight pit to wait for any arbitrary of your child processes. And this happens by passing a minus one as the first parameter. And the return value of this is the process ID. Uh, if your wait pit call returns something larger than zero, if it returns zero, then you know all of your child processes have been caught that, have, uh, that are zombies at the moment. So this is why we run this in a while loop here. So we have a non-blocking call. We wait until our operating system tells us there's no more zombie child processes. And when there's no more zombie child processes, we can continue running down here. So this would catch your zombie, zombie processes. And uh, well, does this work? Well, here we enter three delays first and enter a fourth alarm after the first three have already rung and they are zombies here. Uh, so it does work obviously uh, because afterwards we get the information that the child process actually have exited here. So we get the output. So our wait pit call was successful. Uh, now the thing that uh, is apparent here so uh, is that the wait pit call only catches zombies after we have entered the next alarm delay because our get uh, our, our uh, scanf call is blocking so it only continues executing the program after we've entered a number this is a bit unfortunate but uh, there's no real way to uh, interrupt this blocking call to wait for children so they have to be in zombie state for a bit before we can catch them So that's exactly the problem here. And one question that came up is scanf actually safe to use? Because well, format strings and stuff and buffer overflows, we've talked about this a bit. It depends. So if we use it like this with a percent %d, it's safe to use. Uh, because uh, it has an internal buffer and this internal buffer can convert this 
input character string into a number in all cases. There's a limit to the number of characters scanf actually accepts, like I think on Linux it was 255 according to the man page. So this buffer is that size, but scanf actually takes care not to read any longer strings into that buffer. So scanf with such a form of string to read an integer is safe and it would return, well, uh, a delay value in this integer variable here. Unless, of course, there's a bug in your kernel or libc implementation, which we're not assuming. If we do something like this, scanf percent %s for mm. string buffer, and our string only has space for 10 characters, uh, well, then our compiler and operating system don't know how many characters fit into string. So here you could generate a buffer overflow uh, by, by entering like, like uh, 11 or more characters here. These would overwrite memory locations after strings. So here we have a local variable foo also. So if we enter more than 10 characters, we would overwrite the memory after our string and eventually overwrite the bytes of our variable foo. And we can run a program like this. So it prints the addresses here. Uh, I've just added some code to print the addresses here. And uh, for a regular string, we see, uh, well, we enter it. It's uh, echoed back here. And our value of foo is still 42. Whereas if we had to enter a really long string, and we've seen this in, the, in an exercise before, we see the value of foo is also changed, which is obviously not an action of the program. So that shouldn't happen. So depending on the application, scanf can be safe or not safe. And it's especially not safe when you're just using unlimited strings. So the qu final question here now was error handling. Uh, so uh, there's always a section in the man page describing the return values and possible errors that can show up. And uh, I wanted you to really take a look at error handling because that's really not very often discussed in computer science. And so to figure out where to sensibly add error handling and uh, and do it. Uh, and you can uh, handle errors using the p error libc function, which uh, prints your string you pass to it and the uh, reason of the error here. Uh, so uh, what errors can show up? Now, uh, well, a while loop can't have any errors. Our printf call can have an error. So for printf, our man page says return value, is the number of uh, characters printed uh, or negative value if an error occurs. So what can happen is, usually not when you have a terminal, but when you write to a disk, for example, using printf, that your disk is full. So uh, for example, you can only print the first five characters of your string, and then there's no more space to uh, print something. So this would be indicated by returning like five from printf instead of the length of our string here. So we could check for this. Usually you don't do this when you output to a terminal. A negative error value, if an error occurs, could happen if whatever you output to, a, for example, a pipeline. So we've seen pipelines as a lecture already. And the process that was at the other end of the receiving end of your pipeline has died. So it cannot receive any characters. So it would get uh, an error message back that it was unable to print something. So uh, this is what you could do. You could check for a len that's less than zero and uh, complain that your printf didn't work. Uh, but usually nobody does this for regular printf to screen because you can assume it works. And uh, well, otherwise uh, you can check. So you can check for the original string lengths and subtract the value returned by printf, which is the actual number of characters printed here. And then you could do some pointer magic, pointer arithmetic to advance your pointer by the number of characters and print the rest. To be honest, nobody does this. Uh, it can be critical in these corner cases like a full disk, but usually nobody does this for printf because for a screen, it should, it should just work. So uh, for scanf, you can also have return values here. So for scanf, you get the number of successfully parsed input items returned. Uh, and this can be fewer than you provided for. So for example, if you enter a character string for instead of a number, when you expect a number to be input, you get a zero back because there was no successful character string to be read. Um, and uh, you could also get an error back, uh, like EOF would be the error value, which is a negative value. If, for example, you terminated the input, so for example, you can press Control D, 
uh, to actually terminate your input and then you get an EOF end of file error message back. Now, when you do this uh, and you just uh, check for an error and then complain, but if n is uh, not equal to one, so if you get uh, the information back that zero, for example, elements could be successfully read. And when you try this, it looks like this. So I call well with 42, it works. I call well with the input QQQ. And then I got number, 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 number. What's happening there? Hmm, strange. And so at least one group experienced that problem. Now, the problem is that actually when QQQ is entered, scanf sees eh, it's not a number, so I'm not reading it from standard in, but I'm pushing it somehow back. So somebody else who's trying to read it could read it. Now, unfortunately, the somebody else who's trying to read it in our loop is our next scanf call in our loop. So it again tries to read QQQ as a number, doesn't find it, uh, goes through this here, prompts for the next number and so on until we terminate our program. So the problem here is that our input buffer wasn't flushed when we have an incorrect input. And we could do this. Now, this is something you didn't need to know, obviously. You know, it's, it only was one point for the error handling anyway. So I wanted you really to figure out what errors could show up and to think about this. What you could do in this case, you could flush the standard n, which means you just erase all characters read or input so far from the input buffer. So your next number input would get a fresh input buffer here. The next thing that can go wrong, and you see there's many things that can go wrong, is wait pit. So uh, wait pit uh, returns the process ID of the child process for a stopped or terminated child. If there's no childs that were rated, you get a minus one and an error number set to each child. And if W no hang is specified and there are no stopped or exited children, you get a one. And that's what we're doing for we're checking for a real process ID here. And if we get a zero uh, returned, well, we have that here, uh, that then our, our negative number, then our while loop actually terminates. Okay, so uh, we could actually uh, check this in the while loop explicitly. So if we get a negative number back and it's an each child, we could say, okay, we got an each child. Otherwise we got some other error back. Uh, and if, if the pit is equal to zero, we just break out of the loop because then we have no more child processes waiting. And uh, for the first iteration of the loop, we actually get each child back if we try this uh, because, uh, well, we haven't started a child before. So it says, okay, there is no child to wait for. This is not a critical error, so we don't have to exit our program here. We just exit the loop so we can uh, continue with our fork. Fork can also go wrong. So usually fork returns zero in the uh, child process and uh, the process ID of the child and the parent process. If something goes wrong, you get a minus one back. So maybe you are limited to a certain number of processes by the system administrator. You cannot have more than a hundred processes. Then this would complain if you had already started a hundred alarms or something like that. So you could add some error handling here. So, uh, to uh, check for minus one instead. Uh, you could also try to uh, re-execute the fork system call, uh, but this would increase the system load. So usually something's going relatively wrong and I tested it here. So I set uh, around a thousand allowable user processes here. Uh, on macOS 10, you have a lot of processes running in the background. So I had to set it a bit higher. And then I just changed this program to just fork new, new childs. And then you see after like, uh, yeah, 600 something, uh, you got an error message here from fork. Fork resource temporarily unavailable. So this means we are running out of available processes here for our user. Note, if you do this in an unlimited process context, you might crash your machine because it might just try to fork processes over and over again, which is not a good idea because uh, this takes a lot of overhead. What else can be problematic? So sleep. So sleep could be interrupted. Uh, so usually when sleep returns before the requested time has elapsed, uh, it returns something else than zero. And if, it, if the time has elapsed, it is zero. So if you get something else than zero back, uh, 
This happens due to, for example, the signal was delivered to our process. Then you get the unslept amount in seconds back. So you could try sleeping again for that amount of seconds. So you could try something like this. You could introduce a variable unslept equals delay. And you could then sleep the unslept time and assign the results, so the remaining unslept time, until uh, whoops, uh, until unslept equals to zero. Sorry, there's a, a bug in my slide here. So you uh, exit the loop if, ah, sorry, yes, I, I was confused here. So so I'm, I'm, I'm programming in Pascal from time to time. There's a do until loop and C is of course a do while loop. And then if you do do while here, so do while unslept is larger than zero, then it works. Okay, I have to fix this. So finally, uh, the last system call we have is exit. So can exit actually go wrong? Well, if you look at the main page, it says the exit and also uh, the system call and the libc function never returned. So uh, if they never return, we don't get any indication of errors back. So we assume a program will always terminate successfully on Unix. Okay, so those were the practical exercises. And let's quickly go over the theoretical exercises also. My problem is I have another meeting in like 12 minutes coming up. <laughs> so it's a bit busy today. And this is one here. Okay, I probably need to share my screen again. Can you actually see my see the other slide set now, which says theoretical exercise three? Can can I get some feedback from you, please? Where's my chat? Yes. Okay. Because usually it's indicated using a sort of a green frame and here it isn't. That's strange. Or has it stopped recording? No. Okay, let's continue. So uh, what have we discussed here? So more of the theoretical side. So the first exercise was on resource allocation graphs. So we considered a system with four processes and five resources. And these resources are exclusive and non preemptible. So essentially, we cannot take a resource away and we can only use the resource for one process at a time. And then we have a number of requests here and we can just animate these requests. So we first, first process one wants to use resource three. This is not used initially, so this is assigned. So this is the arrow that points from the resource to the process indicating this is assigned to P1. Then we have process three that wants to use resource one here. That also works. Process four wants to use resource two. Fine. Process one also, also wants to use, use resource five. Yeah, why not? Now process three wants to use resource three. Well, this is still held by process one. So, whoops, we have a request here. So this is the arrow going the other direction, but this could not be fulfilled because R3 was already allocated to P1. Process four wants to use R5. No way, that's already allocated. So it's only a request here. Process two wants to use R4. That's fine. And finally, process one also wants to use R1. Ah, no way, it's already allocated to P3. So the first question was to draw our resource allocation graph and that's what it looks like. So it can get quite a bit complex already for this simple situation. So the second question was which condition has to be fulfilled for a deadlock to occur. And we know from our lecture, it's a circle in the allocation graph and our red arrows here indicate a circle. So we go from P1 to R1 and we have to follow the arrows. So it's important to close the circle in the right direction. So P1 wants R1, but this is already allocated by P3. P3 wants R3, this is already allocated by P1. So P1 and P3 have a mutual dependency where one holds the one resource and the other requests it and the other way around. So this 
cannot be solved without preempting the resources, so taking any of the resources away. So this is what happens here. We have this chain of requests and allocations here. So this is our mutual condition that doesn't work together. All right, uh, second question was uh, about semaphores. There's, okay. I can only see requests and no allocations based on the errors. Am I missing something? So that's that's the direction of the errors. Can you see the slide with the black and red arrows now? The problem description. Oh yes, uh, that's always uh, in the problem description here. It's always a request. So P1 requests are three. And depending on if it's available, then it gets allocated. And if it's already requested, uh, if it's already allocated before, then it gets not allocated. So these are always requests here. And depending on if the resource was free at the point of time we do a re request, we get an allocation like that one here from R3 to P1. And if it was not free, it remains a request which could not be fulfilled. Read from left to right, yeah. And that's that's why we say in the following order, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, reading diagrams. I mean, I'm, I'm used to this for 20 years, so that uh, it's probably a bit difficult if you see it for the first time. That's right. Okay, thanks for feedback. So uh, the next question was about semaphores. And this is a typical question you would find in an exam, just to give you a tip. Uh, so we have three programs, A, B, and C, and these all have a function that just prints their own name. So we have a function A1, just printing A1, A2, printing A2. And so all functions A, one, two, three, belong to PA, all functions B belong to PB, and C belong to PC. And we have a main function, so Process A would have a main function calling first A1, then A2, then A3. And then we have three semaphores, SA, SB, and SC in our system to actually determine the order in which the processes are executed. So A1 could actually have a wait function for some semaphore here and a signal function to release that semaphore after printing it. And we want to ensure a defined order of outputs. So we want to have A1, B1, A2, C1, and so on. So we need to ensure that first A1 is executed and only after A1 has successfully printed its own name. Then we need to ensure B1 gets executed before A2 can get executed. So A2 needs to wait for something and so on and so forth. So the first question was, what are the initial values you have to set the semaphores to? Uh, so uh, we could wait here for A1 to get it started. So uh, we could set SA to one and the others to zero because they still have to be waiting because they come after A1. There's an alternative. We could also set all to zero here and don't put a wait here. So A1 gets executed unconditionally without waiting for a semaphore. We'll see this on the next slide. So the next slide was uh, filling in the table to see if we need a wait and a signal. And if yes, for which semaphore here, so we want A1 to be printed first. So if we have initialized our semaphore SA to one, we do a wait for SA here. So this is one, so we can decrement it to zero, we can print A1. And now we have to signal the next process to start. So the next process that should start uh, is B and with function B1. So uh, we have B1, the function B1 waiting for a semaphore SB. And this is signaled by a1 here. So we have a wait for A, we have a signal of B, and B can then, because it was waiting for that signal and the signal was initialized to zero, now it's one, it can decrement it again, it can start. Afterwards, we want A to be printed again. So we use signal A here. So we go to A2. A2 needs to initialize and call C. So we have another signal C, which C1 waits for. And uh, then we can either signal something and wait for it, or we can just leave it out because we know see, uh, they, these come one after the other. So uh, this is a sequence and I would recommend, uh, because explaining it just, just here uh, in text is a bit difficult, just try to go through it and try to see if we can uh, really find this. 
Question is, do these semaphores communicate with signals? Would it be possible to publish the code from this problem? Well, this is a theoretical exercise. So essentially, uh, this, this, this doesn't really uh, involve codes or signals. It doesn't matter how you communicate them. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I, I could try building something. The problem is uh, when you try to build something like this in Unix, you'd usually use semaphores based on p threads, so multi threading instead of different processes. Now, we haven't talked about multi threading a lot, so that's why I left the, this out. But I can try to provide an example using multiple threads uh, if you're interested. Yes. I'll have to hurry a bit because I'm running out of time here for my next session. Sorry for this. So, the next one was actually pretty easy. Uh, so the question was given this program here, how many axes are printed? Now, uh, the uh, assumption was that the semaphore sem here, which we wait for is initialized to the value four. So we know every time we do a wait, a value of our semaphore is decremented until we hit zero. And when we wait for a semaphore that's already zero, then our wait call blocks. So we print our first X, if we enter the loop, decrement semaphore from four to three, second X, uh, second decremented from three to two, then from two to one, then from one to zero. And when we decrement it from one to zero, we still return. So we can print the fifth x x here. And then we wait for the semaphore that's zero. And since nobody signals our semaphore, well, it tries to decrement it. It's already zero, so it has to block. So no process signals it. So our process hangs here forever. Uh, this final X is, of course, never printed because we have an endless loop here. So this was just to confuse you a bit. I hope that wasn't too bad. So it's five X's. And the final question was about synchronizing using interrupts. So on X86 CPUs, we discussed this in the lecture a bit. We have clear interrupt enable and set interrupt enable. And the question was, why is this a problem? This is a problem because disabling interrupts affects all processes, including the operating system, because STI and CLI are all or nothing. So they either enable or disable all interrupts or none, but not a selective interrupt and not interrupts just for one process. The OS can also be affected itself since it needs interrupts for its own operations, so for timers, for device interrupts. And if a process would forget to re-enable interrupts, that would hang the whole system. Not a good idea. Uh, so I took a look at Linux, how Linux did this. So Linux uh, had a problem that actually uh, time got lost when interrupts were disabled for longer times. And in Linux timer interrupts happen every millisecond here. So this is defined here. And the interrupt handler just increments an internal variable that counts time. This is called jiffies. And this is from kernel 0.12. So one of the very first versions where this was still written in assembly. And our timer interrupt does essentially just increment, inc, inc L means increment a long value, uh, the Jiffy's variable, so 64 bit variable, I think. And since the hardware only has one bit per interrupt to indicate that there was a request, when multiple timer re interrupts could not be executed because interrupts were stopped, we only have the indication that at least one timer interrupt happens. So we missed some of the increments of our Jiffy's variable. So actually our clock was lagging. So the system clock was losing time. And that actually happened in early Linux versions when you did intensive operations on your IDE disk drives, because for several reasons, IDE disk, the IDE disk driver actually disabled uh, interrupts for quite long times. And this meant uh, the more uh, operations you did on your hard disk, the uh, more your clock would lag. And it took them quite some time to fix this. Okay, sorry for being so brief today. Uh, so that's all for today from me. I'm afraid I have to go to our seminar session now because people are already waiting for me. So if you have any questions, please feel free to post on Piazza and of course I'll publish the video later. So thanks for uh, listening and until next time.